First thing we're going to do is all stand up and say the Pledge of Allegiance. The flag is right behind me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, justice, for all. All right, well, hello there. We got a pretty full room. My name is Mary Peliquin, and I'm honored to be the president of the Council of Fort Lauderdale Civic Association. Um, isn't this place great for those of you that have never been in the, in the L.A. Lee YMCA? I want you to know this is one of my favorite buildings in all of Fort Lauderdale, and they have this, the team here has been great for all of us to work with. So I hope you guys got to look around if you've never been here before because this is a wonderful addition and facility for the city. So I really do thank the uh, LA Lee Y and their staff for having us here. So this is the first of two candidate forums being presented by the council. Both forums are being held for the positions that rule our city. And it seems to me that these positions have more effect on our day-to-day -day lives than any other elected official or position. Even more than positions that are at the state or federal level. I feel like these positions are the most important ones to all of our welfare and for our gorgeous city. Now I do want to let you know that only the moderator, Dan Sweeney, who you'll meet in a minute, and myself know the questions that are being asked tonight. I haven't directed him to ask any candidate to ask a specific question, and he may have some questions of his own. So now, I'm thinking about voting as I was uh, thinking about these forums, and I thought, you know, I've often offered this very unsolicited advice to our three daughters. When considering a romantic relationship, the person must be good-hearted. If they're not good-hearted, skip them, because any other attribute doesn't matter. They should be smart and funny. Those go hand in hand. It's essential to be smart. Now, I'm not saying that they have to be a genius, but if you hear that they're not the sharpest knife in the spoon drawer, then move along. A sense of humor is mandatory to get you over the humps in life, and for fun and good times, because really, what's life without fun and good times? So um, I have a few more pearls of wisdom about passion and attraction. But I see that our wonderful super supervisor of elections has walked in. So I'll hold off on those things about passion and attraction till later and let him get up here and um, talk to you all for a few minutes. Joe Scott, Supervisor Joe Scott. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, great. Okay. All, All right. right. And let me get out of your way. I All think right. this one might work. I don't know. It works. I can tell. Okay. Well, give me that one. <laughs> Mary, thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Wonderful to see so many people here. I've been spending all my time at the early voting sites, and I just don't see as many people there. Um, so, uh, so it's good to see a crowd for once. Um, how's everybody doing tonight? All right, so I just want to take a few minutes to tell you guys about some of the things that may have changed since the last election. I do have a few minutes, so I can actually take questions. I'll take a few questions at the end, but I'm just going to start off by covering a few things. Uh, for one thing is that we're really focused this election on trying to get the word out about the three ways to vote in Broward County and to make sure that people know that there are three different you know, equally valid ways to cast your vote. And a lot of people have already chosen vote by mail. Uh, as of today, we have 230,000 people signed up for vote by mail, um, which sounds like a good number until I tell you another number. During the height of COVID-19, we had 600,000 people signed up for vote by mail. So of course, with the new state law, we had to start all over from scratch. And the 230,000 people we have signed up are the people we've managed to get back on the list since we started this push to try to get people to sign up. So to make sure that we cover all the new people we believe are going to want to vote early, 
but may not continue to vote by mail, we've opened new early voting sites. So there were only 22 early voting sites during the last election uh, in, back in 2020. Now we have 28 early voting sites. Early voting sites are a great way to vote because you can actually go to any location in Broward County. So basically, if you think about it this way, if you wait until the last day to vote, you have one choice, one place you can go, and that's your assigned polling place. And for most people, it's a Tuesday. You're at work. Your, your polling place is close to your house, not necessarily close to your job. So do you know what the weather's going to be like that day? Do you know how the traffic is going to be when you get off work and you have to make it to that polling place by 7 o'clock? Do you know how you're going to be feeling that day? If you go vote early, you can potentially go vote at a place that's close to your job. Additionally, if you have a family member or a friend who doesn't live close to you, but you need to pick them up and take them to a polling place, that's something you can do during early voting that you can't necessarily do on election day unless you both live in the same neighborhood. So these are just things for people to think about of why it's really important, why it's a good idea to use early voting, because early voting allows you to have that flexibility to go vote close to your job, to vote close to a family member or friend that you need to take to the, to the polling place with you. All right? And then, of course, we're there for you on the last day, the last day being the election day. It will be there 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, important note for election day is that you cannot bring a vote by mail ballot to drop off at a polling place on election day. All right. Another great thing about early voting is that we do have our secure intake stations, better known as drop boxes, available at every early voting site. So on a day like today, as of right now, there are 29 different locations in Broward County where you can go and drop off your vote by mail ballot. And then when we get to Sunday night, once early voting ends on Sunday night, then that number gets dramatically decreased. After that, you have to go to one of the supervisor's offices, and there are nine of those. That's another thing we've increased since the last presidential election. There used to be two supervisor of elections offices that you could go to to drop off your ballot those last couple of days. Now there are nine. So nine SOE offices that you can use those last couple of days to go and drop off your vote by mail ballot. Um, what else do I need to cover? But I guess the one thing that's really important for people to know, you can go vote in person, all right? If you request a vote by mail ballot and you change your mind and decide you want to vote in person, you can absolutely decide. Of course, you can only vote once, but you can decide to change your mind and vote in person instead of voting by mail, all right? So I'm going to use the remainder of my time to answer a couple of questions. If there's anything that I missed, anything anybody's kind of burning about or wondering about, uh, what questions can I answer for you all? Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I'll let. So we are accepting requests for vote by mail right now. It is extremely easy to do from your phone. BrowardVotes.gov is our domain, BrowardVotes.gov, and it takes about two minutes to do it from your phone. So I just say that to say, why wait until October 7th? <laughs> that is the date that he's asking about, but there's no reason to wait. You can do it right now. You can do it 24 hours a day, anytime between now and 5 p.m. on October 7th. All right, does that answer your question? To register, oh, you know what? That's the date I just gave you, October 7th. My mistake. So the actual date for the, to request your vote by mail is October 24th. October 7th is the voter registration deadline. October 24th is the vote by mail request deadline. How do we find where the early voting locations are? On my website, BrowardVotes.gov, BrowardVotes.gov. There's a button at the top. There's a button there for your vote by mail where you can get your vote by mail request. There's another button for early voting where you can find all 28 of our early, early voting sites. And there's even a tool where you can put in an address and it'll tell you which one is closest. We have a similar tool for polling places where you can put in any address in Broward County. There's a polling place button at the top of our website. 
You can put in any address in Broward County and it'll tell you what precinct you're a part of and what polling place you're assigned to for election day. Yes, sir. We are looking for more. We are looking for more. So if anybody's interested in becoming a poll worker, that's also a button on our website, BrowardVotes.gov. There's a button there for, uh, for, you know, to become a poll worker. So we are absolutely looking for more people for November. Uh, we are all set for August. We're ready. We're ready to rock for August, but we're still looking for folks for November. Anything else? Oh, Mayor Trantellis. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. We would, we would have done that in Lauder Hill, but now we're in Fort Lauderdale, so we'll, we'll, be, we'll be extra sharp now that we're in the city of Fort Lauderdale. All right. Thank you all for your time and your attention. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, ma'am. I think I got a couple more minutes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, in the past election cycles, and you can go back and look at the results because we actually have the results by type. So you can see right on our website, we have these uh, results from last election. You can see about a third of our voters vote by mail, a third of them vote early, a third vote on election day. I mean, all of these votes. And it's not like what you might hear about in other states where they wait until, you know, after the election day votes come in and then start counting the early votes. In Florida, we actually do go ahead and do the tabulation ahead of time. We don't post anything until 7 p.m. on election day. But you'll, one thing you'll notice, when we go to post our results at 7 p.m. on election day, pretty much the results you see right at 7 p.m. are the early vote and election and early voting will be completed. And all the vote by mails that we received before election day will be in those results that we push out right at 7 o'clock. And then after 7 o'clock, we'll be getting more results as we get as we get the uh, results from each of our polling places and any vote by mails that came in at the last minute. Oh, sure. How did? Oh, tampered with. Huh. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, I'll, I'll, as far as early voting, I'll say this: the early voting, the process is very, very similar to election day in terms of the fact that the way you check in, the way you vote on a hand-marked paper ballot, the way you take it over and scan it into the machine, same machines we use on election day. Um, so, you know, so basically the process is almost identical to election day. Uh, when it comes to vote by mail, the way that we make sure that the, the envelope that we're getting back from you has a certificate on it, and, and, and you have to sign that certificate in order for us to open that envelope. So we don't open the envelope unless the signature on the envelope matches the signature we have on file. We have a device in our office that scans that. It scans a barcode to match up that envelope with your file. It takes a picture of the signature on the envelope, and then basically we're able to match it. Somebody's sitting at a PC. They're looking at the signature we have on file and the signature that is on that envelope on the same screen, and they're either deciding if it matches or doesn't match. If it doesn't match, the voter is notified. The voter has until two days after the election to clear that up, um, but they're given notification. We do letters, we do emails, we do text messages, we do phone calls, we do everything we can to get in touch with you to let you come and fix that. But the envelope will never get opened if the signature doesn't match. Uh, we go back and sort out the envelopes that didn't match and they get separated out until they are cured. That's the process we go through is curing. If it's not cured, it never gets opened. So that's how we secure the vote by mail. So again, the early voting is very similar to election day, just earlier, and then the vote by mails are, have, a, have a pretty extensive process to ensure that the person who was supposed to vote by that ballot is in fact the person who voted the ballot. I think, last one, last one. So it's gotta be a great question. Well, thank you for that. Yes, we do send out notifications. We do send out those notifications to people to let them know so that you can have a little bit of self, you know, so you can be even more assured that we received your ballot and that your vote will count. Thank you all for your time. It's been wonderful talking to you all. Have a great evening. Enjoy the forum.
Okay, then. Now, let's see. Where was I? Passion and attraction. Yeah, you don't want to hear about that. So let me just kind of go over. I told our, our daughters, make sure you marry or get in a relationship with somebody with a, you know, a good-natured person. They have to be smart and funny. They have, they, and, you know, don't, oh, the last one I didn't get to say was don't be with a person that, you know, considers you subservient. Uh, or that you're less than that person, or you know, walks ahead of you, and now you're walking behind the person several steps. You know, we we didn't raise our daughters to be stuck with a jerk like that, and that's so they they know about that. So I thought, well, you know what, that's worked out for them. They they've ended up with great people. Well, I got one still on the loose, but you know, the others they've they've ended up with great people. And so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna try this. You know, I'm gonna think about this when I go to vote for somebody. So I'm going to look for a candidate that's good-hearted, smart, funny, and respectful. So we'll see how that works out. I'll let you know. Okay, so we have a few things to go over. Um, please, when the candidates are up here, hold your applause. We don't need clapping after every question. Um, it interrupts the flow of questions, and it takes a lot of time. So just once the candidates from each uh, district are done, then you, know, you can feel free to uh, applaud. Uh, turn off your cell phone ringers, please. Don't uh, make a call, don't post, don't text, don't ruin the forum. Sound familiar? I did plagiarize that. Also, um, there's no booing. This is not Fox News. Any offenders? Oh, I told you all your applause, but that's okay, you can clap for me. <laughs> um, any offenders? will be taken out by the earlobe, and if you don't think that hurts, just try me. I'm good at that. Um, oh, and I should mention, we do have a son, too, and he was our oldest, so we weren't thinking about relationships so much um, for him. But um, when he told us he was thinking of asking his girlfriend to marry him, we were surprised because he always said he wasn't going to get married until he was 35, and here he was 27. So. We were a little caught off guard, and we were quiet for maybe a little too long. I just didn't even really know what to say. And then my husband goes, you should ask her to marry you, and like right away, because quite frankly, she's better than you. <laughs> <laughs> and he did, and they're still together, so. Um, all right, so tonight we're going to start with our District 1 candidates. It may look to you like only one of them is here, but thanks to the magic of Zoom, which we all enjoy, they're both here, as you will see. Um, before we get started with them, let me introduce you to our moderator, Dan Sweeney. Dan is the deputy opinion editor of the South Florida Sun Sentinel. And before taking that job in 2020, he served as a state politics reporter of the paper, during which time he covered the Florida legislature spending two months of the year in Tallahassee. Oh, you poor guy. <laughs> And um, he graduated from the University of Missouri in 2000, so another good Midwesterner, and has lived in South Florida ever since then. So, Dan, if you come up, and thank you one million for being the moderator for our forum. Both forums. Hey, everybody. This, is, this microphone is Mary Science here. Let me just... Nope, I'm good. All right, um, I'm gonna run through the, uh, the, the, the rules of uh, engagement here, and uh, I wanna make clear that I did not invent the rules, so please, you know, the no booing rules should really apply. Uh, first off, uh, the candidates will each receive 60 seconds for an opening remark. Uh, there will be three questions. And time allowed for answers is 60 seconds for the first two and 90, 90 seconds for the third. Uh, there will be time allowed for closing remarks, which is another minute. And as Mary already said, there will be no questions from the audience. Uh, with that said, um, we'll go ahead and welcome the first two candidates, which is for uh, uh, District 1, assuming that uh, the Zoom is working out. Oh, hey, John. <laughs> uh, 
All right, I think we had a muting versus unmuting problem, but I think we're good now. We're more than good. That was very loud. Uh, Wonderful. <laughs> I want to welcome uh, uh, the incumbent commissioner, John Herbst, and also uh, the challenger, Norby Bells. Um, let's uh, first start off, like I said, with 60 seconds for them to each uh, introduce themselves and tell you a little about themselves. And I will start with the person who is in the room. So, Norby. Hello. Oh, is that still too loud? OK. And we have a timekeeper, too, right? Yeah. OK, awesome. So uh, my name's Norby Bells. I'm a permanent proud and a year-round resident of this amazing city of Fort Lauderdale. Um, I'm a small business owner. I, I help other small businesses and leaders realize their highest and truest potential. I'm also the vice president of the North Beach uh, Businesses, and I represent nearly 100 small businesses in our district. I live here because I absolutely love this community. We've got deep roots and we've got a diverse community of amazing people. And I am running for two main reasons. Number one, to be the voice of our residents and our communities. And two, to protect the things that we all love about this amazing city. From our neighborhoods and our communities to our waterways and our beaches, really the lifeline of our city. I'm Norby Bells, and I look forward to earning your support, and, and I'm very excited to be here tonight. Thank you. Good timing. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Herbst, uh, if you could go ahead, 60 seconds to tell the audience about yourself. Sure. Thank you very much, and, and thank you to everybody for participating. Sorry I couldn't be there in person, but unfortunately, a scheduling conflict uh, had me out of town. But uh, again, um, happy to be here. I have been a, uh, an employee and resident of the city of Fort Lauderdale for almost 20 years now. I've been in government service for 25 years at a senior level executive as a finance director, a budget officer, and then as a city of Fort Lauderdale's first city auditor for 16 years. And I uh, ran for election when Heather Moritis, my predecessor, stepped down. Reason I did that is because I've got a long history of public service. I'm not a politician, I'm a public servant. And my depth of knowledge and experience with it in the city is unmatched. I am the longest serving senior executive we have in the city at this point in time. I know more about how this city runs and operates and the problems that it has than anybody else. And I think I am the best person to continue the progress that we've been making for the last couple of years. Right, so with you. that, I will turn it over. And again, uh, I ask for your vote and your support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my first question, uh, and there were some of the questions uh, that were that were uh, offered by, uh, by Mary that seemed to have like a similar theme to them. So those that seem to have more than one uh, kind of question about the same topic, I really wanted to try to concentrate more on those if that makes sense. So my first question is on homelessness. Uh, which continues to expand in Fort Lauderdale. How will you comply with the state's new law on public sleeping and homeless encampments? And what are your ideas in providing housing and services for homeless residents? Uh, since we started with Mr. Bells before, we'll go to Mr. Herbs first. Thank you. So since the law was first being discussed in the legislature, I have been pushing very hard in order for us to have a joint meeting with the county officials so that we can sit down and work on this. This is not something that we can do in isolation. This is a regional problem. The county is ultimately responsible for social services, although the city has been forced to step up for the last several years to make up for some of those deficiencies. So we need to engage with the county officials and sit down and work out a coordinated regional plan. We can't do this in isolation. This has to be something where our neighboring cities also buy into it because for too many years, Fort Lauderdale has been a dumping ground for all the other cities within the county that arrest folks for quality of life crimes, they get transported to the jail downtown, and then they get released and it becomes our problem to deal with it. So again, this, this is something that requires a, a coordinated effort between us, between the county, and the other cities with, uh, within Broward. It, without that, it doesn't work. Thank you, and, uh, and Mr. Bells, go ahead. Yes. Um, as the vice president of a small business association out the beach, we've been dealing with this issue for many, many years. Um, and we've done it in a, an interesting way because, number one, these are human beings. So we need to connect those who want help with services. I've literally been out in the middle of the night walking and connecting with homeless individuals in our neighborhood and connecting them with services so we can get them help. 
Then we have the other ones that are causing problems. And for our businesses, they are very excited about the new law because it allows a little bit more teeth for the people who are causing problems. So, so it's a balancing act. We treat homeless as there's one solution. There's got to be multiple solutions. We do need to engage the county, and we do need to get, engage the other cities. There's a model out there that already works for this. Under the Southwest um, uh, Waste Authority, they have a group of leaders under the Broward League of Cities from each city that is combating our waste. We can do the same thing here with homelessness, bringing the cities together and to come up with a solution that is effective and long-term. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, my next question regards uh, the state legislature. Um, every year, uh, there's something called Broward Days where all the Broward elected officials and a lot of the city officials all go up to Tallahassee and lobby for the legislative priorities of our area. Uh, if you were on the city commission, what would your legislative priorities be? Please give me your top five. Mr. Herbst. Thank you very much. So I've, I've had the opportunity to participate in Broward Days. I'm fortunate to have a great working relationship with several of our representatives and senators up there in Tallahassee, and I look forward to continuing that relationship going forward. But the things that we need to focus on, probably the most critical issue, I would say, is, uh, is the restrictions that we have against Airbnb and our ability to take proactive steps to reduce the impact that it has on our neighborhoods. That would be the first thing that I work on. Second thing that is important to us is to continue to get funding for us to deal with resiliency. So we've been very fortunate in getting funding from the state, um, but it is nowhere near to the level that we need to deal with the issues related to stormwater, water, sewer, and sea level rise. So that would be my next uh, biggest concern. The third issue, it's a continuation of the questions that we have with homelessness, because what the state has done now is created an environment where we can take action, which we couldn't do before, but we still lack the funding to effectively address this problem. We need to build more housing opportunities for those folks that are experiencing homelessness. Again, we can't arrest our way out of this problem. Homelessness is not a crime. We need more funding from the state to facilitate building the types of shelters that we need to, to address this issue. Okay. Um, and, and the last thing is we need to make sure that we are focusing on issues around job creation. Job creation is critical for uh, the city. We need to diversify our economy. We're blessed to have a very strong marine industry and very strong Thanks. tourism. Thanks, John. Uh, Thank wait, you. I, I got I to catch you out there. Uh, even, even with that, he, uh, he only kind of got through uh, uh, four. So let's just call this three here. Uh, what, would your, what would your top three legislative priorities be uh, when you go up to, to lobby in Tallahassee? So, um, well, I have the top five. That's, that's cool. Um, I, I think infrastructure is a major challenge in all of our neighborhoods. When it rains and pours in Fort Lauderdale, it floods. We already talked about homelessness. Homeless is a major issue, um, and we already are dealing with state legislation. I think we can take it further um, to add, add a little bit more teeth, but also some compassion for those individuals who need help, mental health and drug addiction. Airbnbs, as the commissioner mentioned, is a huge issue in our neighbors, neighborhood, and we have limited capacity in our cities to regulate that. We need more ability to control things in our own municipalities. I also think, and a big piece of this, is protecting our waterways. People, the waterways are our lifeline. It's our marine industry, it's tourism, it's our, our property values, it's everything. And we need to be doing much more to protect our waterways. And I think we can let, use the legislators at the state level to help us with this. And most importantly, our public safety. We have a lot of challenges in public safety. Our police do an amazing job, but they are shorthanded. So this is an opportunity. Um, to bring this to the state legislation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I found it interesting there that both of you mentioned Airbnbs is one of your first couple of things, and so I, I want to skip to that question. Uh, vacation rentals are obviously, uh, you know, popping up in many neighborhoods. Um, the state preempts the right to ban them completely, and this year the legislature further tried to curb the uh, local ability to, to regulate vacation rentals, but that law was, uh, potential law, was vetoed by the governor. Uh, what can you do under current law to maintain quality of life uh, in the face of the inability to stop vacation rentals in your neighborhood? Mr. Bells? You know, I, I don't think we're going to be able to stop them. I think that's the reality. I think it's a balance. We have a lot of neighborhoods who don't struggle, and they actually have some good people who are doing these Airbnbs. 
but some of our neighborhoods, one in particular had a murder. I was there, I was present um, for the meetings that talked about what we need to do. We need to have more teeth. Our code enforcement does a fantastic job, um, but we could always use more code enforcement. Um, we're limited by state legislation, so we gotta work into the confines of what we can actually do as a city. And I think we're doing the, as the best we can right now, but we need to be able to have more resources allocated specifically to code enforcement so that we can be out there 24 seven when these issues are happening. Thank you. And uh, uh, Mr. Herbst, go ahead. Sure, um, so as you, uh, as you say, we are preempted from, from doing a lot of the more effective things that would restrict uh, time, place, and, and number of people. But what we are focusing on are the quality of life issues around uh, code enforcement. For example, you know, we set up a registration program. We do safety inspections. We limit the number of people that can be in a building based on bedrooms. We have rules related to when you can put out trash and where you can park and so forth. So the city has been as effective as we can be within the confines of what the state allows us to do. And recognizing that there's room for improvement we have created a nighttime code enforcement team. We are partnering our code enforcement folks with, uh, with police officers so that we can go out there, we can make sure that if we have a party house or something like that, we have the effective tools to address that. We can go out there and we can cite them if need be. And that's really what we are allowed to do. And we just have to continue to do more of that. We've added money to the budget and we're going to continue to do that to address this problem. Thank you. We do have a, a one question from uh, from Mary and her and her grab bag. <laughs> okay. So, um, why, why are you on? Uh, do you want my mic? Yeah. Here's mine. Sorry. Great. Okay. So I have one little bonus question, and um, it's actually a little contest. And John, I hope you can hear me. But I have I all of the neighborhoods that are in District 1 right here in this little jar that are members of the council. So I want each one of you to pick one. And I'll have Dan pick yours. Okay, John? And um, sure. then you'll have 60 seconds, okay, timers, to tell us what you know about that neighborhood. If you pick your own neighborhood, you uh, District 4 candidates want to listen to this, you have to put it back and pick something else. Okay? <laughs> so... Norby, if you could uh, grab one. No, it's definitely not my neighborhood. Right. John, John, I'm going to try to not do you wrong here. Uh, There's no such thing as, a, as, as doing wrong in District 1, Dan. <laughs> it's very well said. Uh, go, go ahead, Norby. This is, this is a great question. I've, I've literally been out knocking on doors in every neighborhood in our district, every accessible neighborhood, and I have my handy notes here from those, di from those um, notes. My one is Sunrise Intercoastal HOA. So it is a lovely gated community just south of the Galleria. There are a lot of families there, um, a lot of business individuals, working professionals, and there's also a lot of part-timers there. So they, they've got a lot of new beautiful homes on the waters. I can tell you that some of their main concerns um, is a universal concern with our homelessness. Um, right outside the, their gates, um, they have the Galleria Mall. The Galleria Mall, as you know, has been a contention, um, particularly for this neighborhood and our neighborhood, Coral Ridge, uh, because we of the unknowns. And so that neighborhood is concerned about what's going to happen with the Galleria Mall. But this late neighborhood is really, truly a beautiful neighborhood with trees, um, and I absolutely love the neighbors, are very happy to be there. They're a little ex um, um, concerned about the overgrowth and development. Okay, thank you. John, I have picked for you uh, Coral Ridge Isles. What can you tell us all about the Coral Ridge Isles neighborhood? Sure. C Coral Ridge Isles, great little neighborhood tucked in just off of Oakland Park uh, Boulevard. Biggest problems that they're having over there are there's a small waterway that um, comes up behind them, uh, behind where Best Buy is. And so we've had a large influx of homeless population that is sleeping and camping out behind there. 
Um, I've worked very, very closely with the Neighborhood Association, uh, Olivier uh, and, uh, and Doug, and we've been working on that issue for a while. We've made numerous visits out there. I've gone out there with our police officers and code enforcement people. Um, the other issues that we're dealing with is the entranceways. There's two. There's one in and there's one out of that neighborhood, and it's impacted by the traffic that's on Oakland Park Boulevard and the new construction that just took place next to the Citibank on the corner over there. So we've been working with uh, with, uh, with FDOT trying to get a new traffic light put in there, challenging to do that because you've got to work through the county. They have to approve traffic lights, so it hasn't been an easy fix, but we've been able to get some lane markings in there because the biggest problem getting into that neighborhood is a challenge. But otherwise, very great neighborhood. It's a little pocket that most people don't even know exists, and most people think it's actually okay. part of Oakland Park. Thank you. All right, that is our... our um... Third, excuse me. That's our that's our fourth question. So we're uh, we're going to uh, allow for closing remarks. Um, you will each have sixty seconds. And uh, since we started uh, the last round, uh, the opening remarks with uh, with Nori Bells, we'll start uh, over here with John Herbst for closing your remarks for one minute. Thank you very much. So again. Um, I think the thing that really separates myself from Norby is the experience that I bring to the table. I've got, again, 25 years as a senior level executive, building and developing budgets, administering these things. I know every single department in this city inside out. I audited it for 16 years. I've been to every location, every facility. I was responsible for moving the police department up to Cypress Creek and getting them out of that decrepit building that they were in. I've toured our water and sewer plants. I have been part and parcel of everything that's been going on with the city from an operational perspective. Government is not something you can pick up in your spare time. You can't just walk in and come to a deep understanding of how this works. And again, experience matters, particularly now more than ever. And I think there is no uh, uh, substitute for having a deep grasp and understanding of the issues that the city is currently facing because they're important. Thank you. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Go ahead, Norby. Bring us home. Yep. Look, I've been engaged in this city for many, many years. As I mentioned, I've been knocking on doors in every one of our accessible neighborhoods, and I hear the same concerns. They feel like their voices are not being heard, and their city leader is not present, literally. And it's very frustrating because we talk about the experience that is needed to run this city. But when we look at the challenges that we've had, the 200 million gallons of crap dumped into our intercoastal, the homelessness that keeps going on the rise, our challenges to the cost of living, all these things while my um, opponent here has been in office and was the city auditor. So what I say is if that is experience that got us here, we don't need the same experience to get us to where we're gonna go. We need someone with fresh ideas, innovation, creativity, and who's able to listen to what our residents need to actually get things done. I'm excited to be your voice for, the, for this city. I'm excited to be your strong voice. My name's Norby Bells, and I look forward to being your District 1 City Commissioner. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks to Norby Bells and John Herbs. Thank you. Hey, we'll move straight into District 4. Uh, so I want to call up the uh, District 4 uh, candidates up to the stage here. Uh, I'll start over on my, my closest side here with, uh, with Warren Sturman. There he is. And then uh, uh, Ben Sorensen. Ted Insura. Marion Howard. And Kevin Cochran.
All right, with the same 60 second limits and uh, with, but with five candidates, this is going to take a little more time. So uh, we'll, I want to uh, you know, kick it off right away and we'll, we'll start uh, uh, closest to me again if we could. Uh, Mr. Sturman, you have the floor to make introductions, uh, 60 seconds. Is this working? Boy, I hope so. Okay, tell me when to start. Ready, set, go. Thank you. Hi, I am Dr. Warren Sturman, your current District 4 Commissioner. As I look around this room, what do I see? I am you. I served as a neighborhood president for 14 years, and this shows in my voting record. I have been the strongest opponent of overdevelopment on the city commission. I've supported our parks voting to save Las Olas median. I voted not to sign the comprehensive agreement for pickleball in Snyder Park. I was there during the flooding disaster, and since then I more than doubled our commitment to stormwater infrastructure. I was a public servant before I was elected. My four children were born and raised here. I served as the vice president of their PTA and soccer coach. I've lived in this district for 30 years and I love this community. I care deeply about our citizens, their well-being, and our quality of life. I would be honored to continue to be your voice in the city commission. Thank you. Thanks. Ben Sorensen. Thank you. Check, check, check. Nope. Yeah, good. Thank you, Ben Sorensen here. Thank you all for being here. Thank you all neighborhood leaders. I want to thank my family, my daughters for being here, my wife. Um, and thank you, Dan, for hosting us. I was elected as a city commissioner in 2018. I was reelected unopposed in 2020. I bring not only the experience, but the ability to bring people together to get big things done. As your city commissioner, I helped lead the effort to get $600 million invested in infrastructure, stormwater, water, sewer. I led the effort to address a homeless encampment in our downtown Fort Lauderdale, helping eliminate that encampment, move all of those people to sustainable housing solutions. I'm also very proud that I was able to help get done three fire stations in our city of Fort Lauderdale. I'm Ben Sorensen. I'm passionate about serving our core needs as a city and I'm someone who gets boots on the ground and gets things done day in and day out. Thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time. Thanks. Ted, go ahead. Good evening, everybody. My name is Ted and Sarah. Um, not only was I born in the city of Fort Lauderdale and Broward General Hospital, I was born right in District 4. I went to school in District 4. I still, you know, I've lived almost on the same block in District 4 from, from the beginning, the 900 block of Southwest 19th Street. Um, I ran in 2022. That was my first venture into uh, running in a, for a campaign. I learned a lot of things since then. Since then, I have doubled down on my involvement within the city. I didn't go anywhere. I stayed here. I was known as an STP, one of the same 10 people that goes to all the meetings. Um, and then I so whether it's planning and zoning, DRC, whatever it is, I'm at the meeting. I suit up, show up, and speak up. And uh, another thing, since then, I was elected unanimously the president of the River Oaks Civic Association. My name's Ted and Sarah. Thanks, Kevin. Go ahead. Great. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Kevin Cotton. Hi, everyone. I'm Kevin Cochran, um, and I'm very happy to be here tonight. A little bit about me. I'm a 30-year tech executive, and I bring business experience here to Fort Lauderdale. In my career, I've pioneered the development of some of the largest, most successful software companies on the planet. And today, here in South Florida, I'm building a new digital ecosystem with a new cloud compute platform to expand job opportunities and provide good economic effort opportunities for all of our graduates coming out of university. In my business, it's focused on investing in the future, listening to customer requirements, and building a product and an experience that's superior to anything else. I want to bring that business acumen here to Fort Lauderdale to improve our citizen experience for all. Thank you. Uh, District 4 is uh, the southernmost portion of the city. Um, Includes a lot of uh, the, uh, some of the downtown quarter along Las Olas, which brings me to my first question. Uh, please tell us your position on the proposed makeover of Las Olas Boulevard, which includes uh, removing black olive trees, widening sidewalks, and reducing on-street parking. 
Uh, Mr. Sturman, why don't we talk? talk uh, why don't we start with you? Oh, I, I, okay, I'll talk in parks in general. First of all, um, elections have consequences. Had I not been elected, it would have been gone. Uh, the last commission, uh, including the commissioner up here, had voted for a plan to remove the median on Las Olas Boulevard. Uh, I held a series of town hall meetings. I got a lot of flack from the, from the uh, business community, from the merchants. But after the town hall, it was overwhelmingly supported that uh, we should keep the median. Ha and I, twice it came up, twice I dug my heels in. And I'm saying um, they're not going to be removing that median on my watch. I'll say that to begin with. I'm a strong proponent of parks. I'm a strong proponent of public lands, and I do want to keep the median in place. We could widen the sidewalk by taking out the on-street parking and make it 20 feet wide. We have a parking garage going down about four or five blocks to the east. There's going to be plenty of parking. So you could still widen the sidewalk by 20 feet by taking away the on-street parking and keeping the median in place. It's a landmark. We need to keep it, and I will continue to secure it as long as I am up here. It might come up again, and I will continue to fight to keep it. Okay, thanks. Uh, ben, go ahead. Thanks. So when I was a commissioner, worked with uh, Commissioner Glassman, and we brought together about 50 neighborhood leaders to work together on this to identify solutions for Las Olas and how to improve the sidewalks, improve accessibility. And that group met for over two years, identifying solutions and, and possibilities for what Las Olas should look like. That was a very fruitful conversation. And where it's led to now is the city commission having two designs that are going to come forward. Uh, for Las Olas. And my view is you continue to engage the public. You continue to look at what makes the most sense for the city of Fort Lauderdale, for our business leaders, for our neighborhood leaders. When those updated plans come back, that's going to be the opportunity for us to engage with the public. I've knocked on over 8,400 doors. I've knocked on the doors of businesses up and down District 4. That's how we can really get a pulse on what our city needs and how to make sure the gem of Las Olas is exactly how it should be. And that includes exploring the possibility of increasing the number of trees and keeping the median. Thank you. Thanks. Ted, go ahead. Okay, this is a very easy one for me. Uh, I've been speaking in favor of keeping the median strip for quite a while. Anytime it has ever come up, conference meeting, commission meeting, wherever, I have always spoken for keeping the median strip. I was, like I said, I was born here in Fort Lauderdale. That is the iconic Fort Lauderdale look. I mean, with the, with the way we're doing it now, we are eliminating piece by piece some of the classic, iconic things that made Fort Lauderdale Fort Lauderdale. You know, when I had visitors coming down from Pittsburgh, family members, we would go down to Las Olas. You know, uh, lots of streets have res restaurants, uh, lots have shops, but Las Olas had those cool trees right down the middle and they were lighted at night and that's what made it special so that I would I would completely eliminate the on-street parking and uh, and just and keep the trees right where they are that's Las Olas that's Fort Lauderdale and God we just can't watch all of our iconic things of Fort Lauderdale just disappear piece by piece okay thank you Kevin great there are three color core problems that we have here. Number one, in this city, we have no commitment to green spaces in our urban canopy. Number two, we don't have a down to, we don't have a master transportation plan. And number three, we are not pedestrian friendly and we have no plan to be more pedestrian friendly as a city. Los Olas brings all three of these things together. Number one, we immediately move anytime we're gonna do development to tear down our tree canopy. This has got to stop. We saw this most recently in Snyder Park. It has got to stop. We have to have an urban tree renewal program, not cut down more trees. We must keep that median. Secondly, we need to rethink the entire transportation grid for this city. And it starts also with Las Olas. Remove the street parking, build parking structures, enable more people to access downtown, downtown access Las Olas, but make it more pedestrian friendly and make it easier to get in and out of the city. And also, not only make Las Olas more pedestrian city, think about the entire downtown area and all of the sidewalks okay. to enable people to enjoy our urban environment. Right, thanks, Kevin. Uh, <clears throat> another thing that uh, is either, I'm, I'm looking at the District 4 map on my phone, but it's very small. Uh, it's either in or close to District 4 is where the proposed either tunnel or bridge is going uh, is going over the new river. Uh, so 
Broward County, of course, has uh, agreed to Miami Dade to join Miami Dade County in building and operating a Broward commuter rail system. Uh, those trains will have to run the FEC tracks with the existing Brightline and freight trains. First, what's your position on bridge versus tunnel at the New River Crossing? And second, uh, what would you propose to alleviate congestion on major east-west roads through Fort Lauderdale? Uh, Kevin, why don't we start with you and work our way back? Yeah, I think the number one problem is here, and you see this also with the homeless situation, is we need to learn how to work better with the county. Certain issues are regional, and we need to actually stop being at war with the county, and we need to partner with them for real solutions. And the bridge versus tunnel debate is a good example of that. It's important to note that whether you're talking about or bridge or tunnel, it's only going to apply to the new computer rail trains. We still have the bright line trains. We still have the freight trains. And the number one thing that we need to focus on is an overall transportation master plan for this city because every day is urban gridlock. East-west traffic is at a standstill. It took me an hour and a half to get here to drive six miles across the city. This is just one example of a master plan that's needed for transportation. And with respect to the rail lines, we need to look at underpasses on Sunrise, underpasses on Oakland Park. You simply cannot get in and out of the city. There are 20,000 more residents coming downtown alone, just posted on LinkedIn. 50 new high rises. We need a downtown master plan. Thanks. Um, the train versus tunnel is just one element of that. To be clear, though, train and tunnel. I am for a decision on a downtown master plan. And that okay. means, and in my particular case, it would be a, a bridge over the New River. Thank you. Uh, Ted, go ahead. Oh, very easy. I've been very vocal on how I feel about this. Tunnel, bridge, in my opinion, we don't need either. We don't need 100 more commuter trains, empty commuter trains, every day coming through our city. We don't, you know, what that would do would open up the, the waterway for the boats. But if we have, I live near 17th Street in uh, Fort Lardo, where trains stop during the day for minutes upon minutes. I sat down there with my dog, Lily. Going east, the traffic backs up past Andrews Avenue. Going west, it backs up past 4th Avenue. It takes four changes of lights in order to clear that area. Now let's throw in 100 more trains, and let's see how that does. We're, this, this, nobody is going to take a train from Hollywood to Oakland Park Boulevard to go eat at Peter Pan Diner. We're just not going to do that. That well, That's not where we are, and uh, I, my stance is neither. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Ben, uh, go ahead. Thanks so much, Dan. Tunnel, and I think that's one of the another differentiating factors between me and other is tunnel. Here's why. We're one of the most cost-burdened communities in the country. When you look at housing and transportation costs, we're one of the most cost-burdened in the country. We need to improve transportation options. That includes train options. We cannot have a train bridge 40 foot high going through our downtown. Our current city commissioner wants to defer to the county and allow the county to decide for us in the city of Fort Lauderdale what's best for us. I say absolutely not. We're not going to have Melinda Bowker and the downtown residents be faced with a noisy, loud train bridge running right through downtown. We need to push and demand for a train tunnel. As a commissioner, I voted for the tunnel. That vote has been reversed since. We need to get back onto the train tunnel approach. We're going to engage the federal government to find solutions and dollars to make the train tunnel work so that all the Fort Lauderdale residents have an option to use train to navigate our north-south boundary and also moving freight to the western track. I've already started to engage with our federal right. authorities to move freight to the western track. This is a collaborative okay. approach we need. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Warren, go ahead. Okay, I could spend two hours on this. I'm, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm the city's representative to the NPO. We deal with this. I have a degree in engineering, so I'm very well versed. I've been an advocate from the tunnel from the very beginning. Keep in mind the county is going to own this, operate this, fund this, so we cannot do this on our own. We have to work with the county. This is something that's simply out of our reach. I introduced a resolution reaffirming our tunnel as the preferred alternative, so you're a little bit mistaken there. I also introduced the motion. I was the one who introduced the motion to hire BDO to explore ways to fund the tunnel. The, there are 24 trains that went up to 60 now. The 24 freight trains are not going to move. It could be up to 105 trains once commuter rail comes down the pike. Um, 
We, I, we do have another thing on the NPO going east-west to answer that question, undercuts. Undercuts, the tunnel and train is not gonna help 17th Street, it's not gonna help Davie, it's not gonna help uh, at State Road 84 in my district, as well as northbound and commercial and whatnot. There is money from funding for undercuts, so the cars will go underneath the, the train on those intersections, and I am advocating for that in addition. Understood, thank you. Um, my, uh, my last of the three questions up here, uh, I'd like to have you also address the homelessness question. Uh, that was one that kind of came up again and again, and uh, I'll repeat it for you. Uh, homelessness continues to expand in Fort Lauderdale. How will you comply with the state's new law on public sleeping and homeless encampments, and what are your ideas in providing housing and services for homeless residents? Uh, Mr. Stern, go ahead. Oh, me? Yes, Mr. Oh. Sturman, go oh, ahead. I, again, I have five hours for this one. Let me know when I start. <laughs> Is it time to start? Okay. Um, I've been appointed by my fellow commissioners to take the lead on this. They say the county and city are not working together. Lamar and myself have been working for months on this. We have a working relationship with us and spearheading a comprehensive plan for homelessness. We've now looped in the United Way. We've looped in uh, uh, Salvation Army as well as Hope South Florida. The key is low barrier shelters. The county does not have them. We're prepared to launch this. We're starting with some pilot programs to go through. And number two, let's talk about the stock Arcade. I was the first, originally the, uh, the plan was to use that as a homeless shelter. The county has said there's not going to be any sheltering there. We're now proposing a plan to have a homeless assistance center there, having triage, having social services, having drug, mental health rehab. A pilot program is already underway with the city and ourselves. Broward Health is on board. Um, I, I don't have time to, I mean, I, see me afterwards. I have so much to say about homeless and I am so excited about the initiatives that we are taking. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ben, go ahead. Thanks. Um, homelessness is one of the reasons I ran for city commission in the first place in 2018. Um, and you hear a lot of talk about homelessness, but look at the action. What it takes to address homelessness, one, is more affordable and workforce housing. As a city commissioner, I pushed to get city land turned into workforce and affordable housing. We did that in multiple locations throughout the city. We have another massive location called Broadview Park. You probably haven't heard of it much because it hasn't been pushed. This is amazing opportunity for over a thousand uh, workforce and affordable housing units. We also have to take a very collaborative approach, which we did when I was a commissioner, to identify opportunities like community court to address homelessness needs, also to find solutions across the community, and this involves being able and willing to take homelessness head on. When I was a commissioner, we had regular meetings with the county, uh, Fort Lauderdale Police Department, fire rescue, and other stakeholders, and we went through the HMIS, HMIS system, which is all of the homeless people in the city of Fort Lauderdale. We identified where they were, what to do, and provide additional resources to them. That's how we address homelessness. All right, thank you. Thank you. Ted, go ahead. Okay, in my opinion, you want to know what I think. I think we need to take this law and enforce it immediately. We've had too much. The, the homeless situation is just running too rampant. We now have teeth, we now have a law that says what we have to do, and we need to enforce the law. I, our, right now, the homeless task force, bless them, there's nice people and stuff, but golly, we gotta do more than just shaking hands and handing out sandwiches. I mean, right now, I have been in meetings where they said, hey, your neighborhood, we can present a new park to your neighborhood. And people said, no, we don't want a park because it's just gonna become a homeless uh, place where they all gather. We can't have that in this city. We have, I ride the bus, on number 40 bus in front of the uh, Broward General Hospital. That, that area where you catch the bus, there's three people living in there. You have people that have been working 10, 12, 14 hours coming out of the hospital to catch the bus to go home. You can't even get near the bus stop because, and we can't have that either. I mean, we gotta draw the line, get a tough stance, all right. and end it. Thanks, Ted. Kevin, go ahead. Yeah, this is a good example. In the business world, when you have a challenge, you don't have the luxury of waiting six, seven, eight years, watching it get worse and worse. That puts you out of business. At the end of the day, over the past eight years, the homeless situation has only worsened in our city. It's been a lot of talk, very little results. And now with this new state law, for the very first time, we can actually take action. But what's sad here is even though this state law, we knew this was coming, we did not plan for it. So we do not have a coordinated plan to deal with what happens when this state law takes effect. 
What happens when every other city starts arresting uh, homeless people because they're sleeping on the beach and then they send them to Fort Lauderdale and then they're released within 24 hours? They're here in Fort Lauderdale. We need to absolutely work with the county to start investing very heavily and very immediately in appropriate number of shelter spaces to get these people into care under a roof over their head. It's the humane thing to do. We should have been planning for this literally a decade ago. Thank you. Uh, we'd like you all to, to have a moment to answer about one of the neighborhoods in your district. Which neighborhood is up to you and luck? <laughs> oh, um. <laughs> oh my god, it's so loud. <laughs> are you are you <laughs> Willie was your own. Yeah. Okay, you didn't lose it. Back in, put it back in. Don't let it. Well, no, Don't I am throw it away. I might want that one. <laughs> <laughs> I love that man. It's, it's close to my neighborhood though. It's almost as Oh my God, these guys are tough. Okay. Well, I better give her. Here you go, Josh. Thank you. Best supporting actress. Okay. Yeah. Not your own? No, no, it's not my own. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Um, go, go ahead. I picked Beverly Heights. Um, it just what? Now, what's the question? Just a little couple of things about them. Tell us about the neighborhood, please. Okay, Beverly Heights is a very interesting. It's a smaller neighborhood. It's nestled between uh, Coley Hammock and downtown. Some of the issues they have uh, basically are uh, cut through traffic going to the beach. We have the same thing in Coley Hammock. Originally, one of the proposals was to have one-way pairing to go through that. I listened to that neighborhood, Coley Hammock's neighborhood, exquisitely against that. So that that plan has been scrapped. We are not going to go ahead with that. Uh, they are very much concerned about. Lost it. Hang on. Okay, can I, get, can I get five more seconds? Okay. Okay. They're worried about uh, the median, what's going to happen with the median, and they're all in favor of the plan to preserve the median, get rid of the on-site parking, and widen the sidewalk along Las Olas Boulevard. Uh, they're right next to them. We have the art show. Beautiful neighborhood. Some of their concerns are some of the developments that are coming down the pike. Wonderful people there, and uh, love going there. Ben, go ahead. Thank you. I've got River Oaks Civic Association, which uh, we know the president of that sitting, <laughs> sitting to my left. Um, great neighborhood, obviously. And uh, River Oaks is one of uh, several neighborhoods in District 4 that really have significant flood impacts. And so as a city commissioner, when I was elected in 2018, this is something we prioritized to get a stormwater system into River Oaks. And I'm proud to say with the support of the entire commission, uh, we were able to do that, over a $100 million project that's been invested in River Oaks, and it's coming online very soon. A lot of the infrastructure has been done. They're finishing up a pump station right now, which not only is that pump station going to better serve River Oaks, but it's also going to serve Edgewood neighborhood, which, again, is a phenomenal success of the city. We need to do more stormwater infrastructure, and there's also an amazing preserve in River Oaks called the River Oaks Stormwater Preserve, which is part of our flood management that we were able, again, with the city commission to de dedicate and preserve for our communities. Uh, wonderful place. It's also one of the neighborhoods that has this uh, dynamic of we have to work to preserve our neighborhood, but also deal with some of the businesses. So Lauderdale Marine Center abuts River Oaks. And so it's a constant work and collaboration to ensure that both the neighbors can uh, peacefully and successfully live and uh, the business can can thrive as well. And so that takes a commissioner who's on the ground working together to ensure both can survive. Thank you. Thanks. Go ahead, Ted. All right, very good. Near and dear to my heart, I got Croyson Park Civic Association. Uh, let me tell you, I graduated from Croyson Park Elementary School. I learned how to swim at Croyson Park Pool. I still swim about four times a week at the Croyson Park Pool. Um, when I was growing up, there was no real River Oaks. We were all Croyson Park. So some, you know, that was, and then, and separates River Oaks from Croyson Park is Southwest 9th Avenue. I live on the corner of 19th Street and 9th Avenue. So I'm just on this side in the River Oaks when right across the street is Croyson Park Elementary School. 
I mean, that, that area, we, they've been able to do a great job, the Civic Association, with keeping the canopy with, with God, they have so many beautiful tree-lined streets there with oak trees. They look like tunnels going down there. I mean, uh, another thing that is near to dear in my heart in Croyson Park, the neighborhood, is with the Lauderdale Memorial Cemetery right in Croyson Park. That is where uh, both of my parents are buried in that cemetery right in Croyson Park where we used to play football as kids going up because only a small portion of that cemetery was used. So it was mostly just all great grass. And, uh, but, but Croyson Park, near and dear, I consider, you know, uh, my second neighborhood there in uh, District 4. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Great. And I got Harbordale, which is very close to my neighborhood of Harbor Inlet. So Harbordale is just south of Federal between 84 all the way up and abutting to Rio Vista and Lauderdale Harbor, bisected by Southeast 17th Street. Um, being, being very close resident there, uh, I'm a runner. Um, you probably see me in my local run clubs. I run through that neighbor fre neighborhood frequently. Um, some of the key issues that face uh, Harbordale um, include problems of homelessness. You know, you mentioned the problems of homelessness uh, overtaking parks. There's a lovely little park in Harbordale, which is just unfortunately almost something that you don't want to bring children to uh, just because of the homeless situation there. Also, the traffic, uh, making life in Harbordale actually very, very difficult. As a runner, sometimes to cut through traffic for people trying to escape Southeast 17th Street to find quicker ways uh, to get to Rio Vista or to Federal, uh, people driving through uh, stoplights it's ex can be extremely dangerous. So again, I think the issues of Harbordale reflect the issues of broader Fort Lauderdale. Uh, we need to be more aggressive about solving city problems, actually taking action on our homeless situation. Um, and we need to have an actual master plan for traffic and actually rethink how to end the gridlock in our city so our streets are safe for pedestrians and bicyclists and runners like myself. Thanks. Uh, so that's uh, that's our three questions there. I have like another dozen of them I could ask, but well, we, I, I know we gotta we gotta move along. Um, so I want to give you all a minute to to, to close. And uh, since we did opening remarks this way, we'll start with you and work our way down this way. Uh, Kevin, if you could just kind of give your 60 second elevator pitch to voters why they should vote for you. Yeah. Again, uh, very happy to be here, and I'm the only candidate on the stage that has 30 years of business experience and a business mindset to solving chal challenges and scaling infrastructure to support some of the most successful companies on the planet. And I want to bring that here to Fort Lauderdale to address issues with planning and investment and solving issues that affect our everyday quality of life. By day, I'm a community activist, super involved in my community. I'm a marathon runner. I started a running club that now has 250 people strong that runs through Cochrane River. Please join us every Tuesday at 630. Most recently, because of my love for nature and my love for green spaces in this city, I was the, the founder and the chairman of the committee to save Snyder Park so that we could try to preserve the very little open space that we have left in our city so we have some place where we can get quiet relaxation and just enjoy the beauty of nature that we are losing so much of here in Fort Lauderdale. Thanks, Ted. Yes, I'm the only candidate that's sitting up here that was actually born in the district and have 60 plus years of living in District 4. Um, the, the, the main reason why I started, I ran the reason because I did not like what I was seeing happening to our neighborhoods. It seems these, we had enough of these professional politicians. I think they put their needs first before the neighborhoods, before the residents' needs. They're supposed to be a servant of the people. I think they crossed the line over to being the masters of the people. And we need to take that back. And that's, uh, and that is why I'm running. I am, I'm hands on, I'm all the time, boots on the ground. I'm doing things, River Oaks is going just great. And, uh, and I can work. I have worked with many of the uh, civic associations. They know they can call me up if they need help or they need somebody to attend a meeting to help them out. They know I will be there in a second. Um, District 4 is my life. It's all we has been. And uh, we need to take it back, back to the residents. Thank you. Thanks. Ben Sorensen, go ahead. Thank you, Ben Sorensen. I've run my own business for 20 years doing corporate leadership, executive coaching. I've been in the United States Navy Reserve 17 years, and I've been your city commissioner for years. I bring together a wealth of experience and ability to solve problems. One, we need to include neighborhoods in our stormwater master plan that are not included, like 
uh, Riverside Park and like Shady Banks are being excluded currently. We need to bring those back. We need to continue to advance my, the tree ordinance that I led as a commissioner to begin a tree ordinance to protect our canopy. We need to get lobbyists off of city boards. They do not belong on our city boards running our city government. We need a commissioner who has the time to dedicate to each of you. Because I own my own business, I can take the time to walk the neighborhood, 8,500 doors, and hear your needs. I did that as a commissioner, and I'll do that as your future commissioner. And lastly, we need someone who's invested in making our city better with a big tent, hearing everyone, including everyone, working together. Ben Sorensen for your city commissioner. Thank you. Thanks. Go ahead. Am I, am I clean up? Yes, yes. Bring us home. Okay, tell me one. Tell me one. Are we ready to go? Go, go, go. Every second. Okay. <laughs> there are five candidates in this race, but I am the only one to have received every single major endorsement. Police, firefighters, city workers, doctors, teachers. Why? This is because I've lived in this district for over 30 years and they know me. As the commissioner, I have increased police and fire response, enhanced and protected our parks, worked with the county on homeless to get results coming down the pike, and double our stormwater flooding commitment. In summary, I have a proven track record of serving this committee and for preserving our quality of life. Let's keep this a neighborhood voice on our city commission, not give it away to outsiders. I am Dr. Warren Sturman, running for re-election. Alphabetically, I'd be the last name on the ballot. If you remember only one thing, remember, save the best for last. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, and thanks to all the candidates. Okay, thank you. Let's have, you guys have a seat for a minute. I just want to say, for those of you that came to see it that are in our September 10th forum, that would be for District 2 and the mayoral race, a race um, you might have noticed we had a little trick up here where they had to pull things out of a hat. So I just don't want you to get comfortable and think that's going to be the same thing for you because I'm thinking of other things, so just so you know. So I want to thank all of the candidates, the four, and we are missing one here tonight, and uh, District 1, Norby and John Herbst and Dan Sweeney. But I, I want you guys, I hope, I think everybody in this room is somebody that's going to go and vote, right? Except for not quite yet. <laughs> Soon come. And um, I thank everybody for coming on the, the board of um, the council. I really appreciate it. And Dan, thank you so much. I'll see you in four weeks. Uh, happy to be here. See you in a month. <laughs>